Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. This episode is the third in a series on global project finance, organised in partnership with SMBC Group, with four episodes covering Europe, Australia, Asia and the US. This series is hosted by Aurora with guests from SMBC, various law firms and Aurora. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora for APAC in California. We're very much looking forward to today's discussion. This is the third of a four-part series on project finance in partnership with the SMBC Group. We've had an EU and Australia-focused discussion a couple of months ago, and this discussion will be focused on the wider Asia-Pac region, with the fourth episode on the USA coming in another month or two. The questions we are going to ask are going to be reasonably consistent across the four pods, but we'll hopefully tease out some of the regional differences across the global project finance community in the energy space. We have some excellent guests in today to help us with this discussion. Jean So, Head of Renewables and Sustainable Energy across Asia at SMBC. She sits in Singapore. She's had a long and distinguished career at SMBC with 16 years at the bank. Welcome, Jean. Hi, everybody. And Jason Humphreys, partner at Allen & Overy. Like Jean, a long time at his current employer with 27 years at Allen & Overy, he spent the bulk of his career out of their Singapore and Tokyo offices. Welcome, Jason. Thanks very much, Hugo. Really pleased to be here today and to have a chance to talk to you. And finally, Rowan von Spreckelsen, Principal at Aurora. Rowan leads Aurora's entries into new market across APAC. His current focus is on Japan. Welcome, Rowan. Thanks for having me. Let's maybe start with the basics. Gene, how do you see the level of activity right now in the energy and project finance space in APAC more broadly, both by technology and, and by geography? We're seeing an uptick in the development of hybrid projects, including battery storage, as well as newer technologies such as floating offshore wind and hydrogen, although they are still new to the market. We're seeing more demand in the CNI space, given that more corporates are required to procure renewable energy. Maybe I go where we're seeing some activities. In India, um, it has always seen a high level of investor activity and many players already have an existing platform or have made some form of investment in the country. Growth is further supported by round-the-clock hybrid type solution and open access installation driven by demand from CNI customers. Moving on to Taiwan, while well, Taiwan has run into headwinds recently with the cost overrun for offshore wind plants, strong interest in the offshore wind sector remains given that the wind resources are among the best worldwide and the regulatory environment for renewable in Taiwan is favorable for investors. But it will pivot towards more CPPAs instead of Thai Power PPA. In Vietnam, many developers and sponsors have a lot of interest in Vietnam. Vietnam has already been a leader in the region in terms of solar capacity addition over the last few years. Following the release of its latest PDP-8 draft, the country aims to transit away from coal or hydro, choosing to shift effort into gas, wind and solar. Its long-awaited direct purchase agreement scheme is also likely to attract a great deal of interest from developers, although there is a low visibility on the launch of the pilot DPPA. For Indonesia, Indonesia still has a lot of room for growth in terms of renewables. While a new law was passed in September 2022 that mandates PLN to procure renewable energy, limited clarity around its tendering process makes it more challenging for developers who want to scale out their renewable capacity in Indonesia. The country is nonetheless moving in the right direction with the recently announced carbon trading mechanism for coal plants that is expected to commence this year but little visibility on how this will be implemented. We do see an overall activity picked up in Indonesia. As for South Korea, offshore wind in South Korea is said to be quite a key area of growth for the country as they target to increase renewable energy to reach 21.6% of the total share of power generation by 2030. We expect that 
there will be a huge demand on liquidity on offshore wind development in the coming years. Gene, that's a great answer. And we've certainly covered a few of the key markets there briefly. Jason, does this align with what you're seeing in the region? Before the show, we were talking about a few areas, Australian hydrogen and, and Japanese and Korean off-takers. Where is their interest in CCS? Um, some of the big renewable projects we're seeing in Indonesia. Anything you want to add here, I suppose? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with uh, with everything that, that Gene's been saying. I mean, I think just, just taking maybe the geographies first, um, all of the geographies, um, you know, India, Taiwan, Vietnam, um, Indonesia and South Korea that, that Gene mentioned have been very active for us. And we're seeing a lot of activity there. Um, you know, India um, across the board, uh, be it uh, people looking at hydrogen projects, um, sort of very early doors. Uh, but also there's been an enormous amount of renewables work being done there. And, and, and myself and, uh, and people like SNBC have been, been very active in that space. Um, I completely agree uh, with Indonesia um, and Gene's assessment that, that actually there's a lot more starting to happen in Indonesia. I think Indonesia has been a little bit of a, a victim of perhaps sometimes changing the regulatory rules around renewables. Mm. Uh, and and so actually what we've seen is perhaps not as much scaling of, of some of the renewable projects as we'd hoped sort of after uh, you know, ourselves and SNBC did SIDRAP, the first wind deal in, in Indonesia, for example, we thought that there would be quite a pipeline hopefully coming through. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that's been sort of limited to, to really two projects that have been project finance. So uh, I think, you know, there is much more uh, focus on, on Indonesia and we are seeing um, news of a lot more projects there. Um, similarly, offshore wind generally, you know, South Korea was mentioned and, and also Taiwan. Uh, as well as Vietnam, uh, India, and Australia, um, lots of lots of people looking at that plus Japan. Um, and again, the, you know, there's some regulatory challenges. There's there's some sort of supply chain issues, etc. As as Gene was mentioning around the headwinds, um, but it it remains as a, as a sort of um, product uh, something that people are very very uh, interested in in all of those jurisdictions. And and we're hoping that you know, for example, as as Gene mentioned, when PDP eight comes out. There will be a lot of uh, a lot more sort of op- offshore wind activity there. I-, I think people are still a little bit wait and see on Taiwan. There's obviously been a uh, the sort of third auction round, um, and, and some of the the features of that are really effectively combining uh, what you've seen in the first two rounds. So uh, local content requirements with a with a sort of auction uh, and price formula. Um, and so, as Gene mentioned, again, the, the corporate PPAs are going to be really, really important there. And, and maybe it'd be worth just spending a couple of couple of moments on corporate PPAs. I mean, mm-hmm. those are are very much driven by the regulatory framework within the, the relevant countries. Um, and so in Japan, you know, mostly you sort of need to have a utility provider or, or registered um yeah, registered sort of um, distributor or, or, or registered uh, participant in those corporate PPAs, which has slowed things down a little bit. Uh, you know, Taiwan introduced its its kind of wheeling and 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 regulatory framework to allow corporate PPAs a few years ago. As Gene mentioned, we're seeing similar moves uh, into in Vietnam. Mm. Um, but then, when you look at somewhere like Indonesia, you know, grid connected. Um, Grid connected PPAs are, are pretty difficult to achieve because of the PLN exclusive uh, territory requirements. So, it, definitely a lot of interest in corporate PPAs, but but they're very much a product of of their markets. Um, you know, and and a number of sort of markets are are sort of traditional PPA markets rather than um, rather than being merchant markets. And, and obviously, we can talk about that a little bit more as we go through. It might be also worth just touching on on Japan in that context. Jason, you mentioned around kind of offshore wind and and corporate PPAs. In terms of what I'm seeing at the moment in in Japan, it's there's a there's a huge amount of kind of growth in both of those areas. Um, so you mentioned about some of the offshore wind ra- rounds in in some of the other uh, APAC regions. Japan's got the next round coming up at the moment, and there's a there's a huge amount of domestic and and kind of international uh, focus on that. And the growth in the corporate PPA market there has seen a lot of a lot of interest potentially going to see the, the the first kind of financing of one of those PPAs coming through in kind of in this year at some point, and that is offsetting some of the challenges that Japan's having on 
the onshore renewable side of things with regards to kind of grid and land constraints that are just um, creating creating a kind of uh, challenging environment in, in some instances. So a lot of focus on offshore wind, corporate Bay APA market, batteries are also starting to be a major focus there. Um, and they've got a new government support scheme long term that I think is that is building out a lot of the framework to see a lot of interest in hydrogen and ammonia co-firing as well. So mm. that's another pretty big topic, particularly for the utilities that are thinking about their thermal fleet and what that will look like over the long term and how they decarbonize that. Terrific. A follow-up question for, I suppose, both Jason and Gene. You know, one of the dominant themes of the last couple of years has been rising interest rates globally, and, and it varies a little bit by market, but the general trend is very much upwards after two decades of, of very low interest rates. You know, this is also happening at the same time as we're seeing real supply chain issues globally. Um, what impact is this having on your work on project finance terms and negotiations right now in the APAC region? I think that the, the first thing to probably highlight, maybe we should have highlighted this at the beginning, is when you look at APAC as a region, and I think this comes through from, from sort of what I was saying before, it, it isn't it isn't sort of homogenous. There, mm. there are very, very different markets, legal regimes, sponsors, requirements, regulatory regimes, land regimes, et cetera, in all of the different markets. So I think probably the first point to make is actually you don't necessarily see the same knock on in in every in every jurisdiction and you know different jurisdictions have different um particular challenges or particular approaches to things um so you know just by way of example uh same sponsor same type of of renewables project financing in one market you may need some completion support in another you, you just have contingency within the equity um so i think the i mean the, the simple answer is that i think people are Lenders are are obviously looking quite closely at projects. I've seen some projects not necessarily get away mm. or, or 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 have some delays in some markets. But you know there is still a, a very healthy appetite for good projects to finance good projects. I, I think it's not just an impact on project financing, but I think also, you know, even in the M and A sector, we're seeing a lot of activity. But again, there tends to be a lot more demand for very good projects, and and, and valuations mm. need to be. Um, need to be carefully considered because I think there's potentially still a bit of a gap between people's expectations, particularly with the with the headwinds that are coming through, as you mm. mentioned. Yeah, just to add to that, I agree with Jason. Um, despite the market conditions, sponsor appetite for project finance deals, I think, remains strong. Um, sponsors are also increasingly interested in solutions to reduce increase, increasing cost or cost overrun, as well as hedging solutions to mitigate any interest rate or FX risk. So banks generally would need interest rate to be almost fully hedged so that the projects would not subject to interest rate fluctuation. And in a high interest rate environment, we see that structures like mini perm may gain more traction as sponsors take a view that the interest rate will fall in the near term. Rowan, just building on that then. So, you know, interest rates are one part of the story, but we're also seeing, as I said, much tighter supply chains and, and capex increases. I know in Japan, there are real concerns about the deliverability of some of the government targets, which are quite aggressive. What's the consensus on the ground in Japan? Is the government going to be able to hit its targets? Are some of these going to be delayed? How's it going to play out? Yeah, I think, I mean, a, a good example of this is the recent solar auctions that they've that they've held in Japan. I think the, the those auctions have typically had the, the new they used to have a feed-in tariff system. They've moved to the feed-in premium structure. Um, so there was a change in the regulatory regime. Those auctions have had ceilings on what kind of price you can bid in. And I think a lot of the supply chain and project cost increases that we've seen kind of globally have come in to bite on that. So that some of those project ceilings coming down faster um, than, than expected, accounting for these project cost increases, such that we've actually seen under kind of subscribed auctions, uh, particularly on the on the solar side, where some of those cost reductions that were previously expected haven't come to pass, and, and it's kind of challenging to get those off the ground. And instead, we're therefore seeing the the a lot of those projects starting to look at the corporate PPA market instead of some of those auctions. Um, but we are seeing those delays, like supply books to get certain uh, technologies off the ground, taking kind of 12, 24, 36 months to kind of get, get those projects booked in. And I think that is 
quite different across the different APAC markets, depending mm. particularly where there is local manufacturing for some of whether it's the wind industry, whether it's batteries, whether it's solar. Um, so this does this does look a little bit different. The the common question we often get asked on this is is kind of expectations over recovery. Uh, will we come down to levels that we previously were expecting? And I think one of the big uncertainties in this is actually the recent announcement on the US side of the Inflation Reduction Act sees a lot of capital pushed to the US. And there is a there is a question mark of whether or not we actually see as a result of that demand didn't lessen, the IRA is gonna, gonna drive a lot of uh, growth over in the in the US on the manufacturing and, and capital deployment. And therefore, will we actually see it take a little bit longer? It's not a one, two year recovery thing, it's a three to four uh, year recovery issue um, playing out across across APAC. Let's maybe pivot to market design then. So Jason, very much take your point that across APAC, there's a whole different range of designs and, and regulatory frameworks in place. At least some of the markets, you know, have been on the kind of long and slightly challenging journey to deregulation, greater competition, disaggregation, uh, but but at different paces and and they've ended in different places. You also mentioned there that Indonesia had some stops and starts and made some changes along the way and, and that had created some issues. Gene, is there a way, I mean, how are project finance banks thinking through regulatory and policy risk across APAC? Or is it just, it's just a very different story in each market and there aren't really consistent themes? Yeah, I think APAC is quite a diversified region. Um, so every market is, is quite different um, and they have their own regulation and their own regulatory regime. Of course, we see... Taiwan is one of the very good examples um, in terms of building the offshore wind projects. They have very clear regulatory framework, which definitely helped to accelerate the development of uh, renewable projects. Generally, in, in Asia, I would say that we are comfortable with the regulatory risk. Um, it's just the implementation can be quite slow. So like in Indonesia, as Jason mentioned, the regulatory framework for renewable projects is still um, not clear um, how the project is going to be rolled out implemented. Um, in Vietnam as well, they have implemented solar projects, but um, we're still waiting for the new PDP-8 to come out um, so that they can roll out wind and solar. So that, in a way, creates a lot of um, difficulty in trying to navigate in this market, uh, in building more capacity. And Jason, your take here, like, do you see some common themes emerging about what major APAC energy markets will look like? I mean, you know, there's some really bedrock things like, you know, using auctions to maintain competitive tension and and those types of things. Or, Or is it, you know, they are just pursuing very different paths and it's dif- difficult to draw out common themes. I think there's a number of common themes, but but people are, or different markets are approaching those in, in different respects, in different ways. Um, so one of the common themes, I mean, obviously we're seeing a big push towards energy transition as, as, as we're seeing worldwide. And, and that is quite a, a common theme. I think it's probably worth mentioning a couple of, a couple of things here. I mean, one is the different incentive regimes you see um, you know, two are uh, is the is the use of private capital within that. So, for example, you know, the uh, Asia Development Bank has has its energy transition mechanism, which mm. has been been rolling out, um, you know, and, and starting to implement in, in places like the Philippines and, and in Indonesia. Um, and I think that that's quite innovative because when you look at, for example, Asia Pacific, um, you know. I've got statistics that almost 50% of the primary en- energy in Asia comes from coal. Uh, the average coal-fired plant is just 13 years old. If you compare and contrast that life with with Europe, et cetera, there's much more remaining uh, useful life in those in those plants. They're a lot newer. So, you know, things like that that energy transition mechanism, I think, will will really help. Um, yeah, I know, for example, as well, the World Bank is pushing, is pursuing opportunities to um, assist with with um, energy transition on a regional basis and also incentivizing sort of smaller 
uh, projects that might otherwise not be economically viable uh, and, and also sort of um, energy, energy reduction mechanisms, et cetera. Um, and I think the other sort of large theme I'm finding is very much um, a convergence of technologies and interest. So, you know, everything from I'm doing doing things on the on the sort of uh, demand side. So with data centers, with big tech companies demanding mm. renewable energy um, you know, through to suppliers, through to sort of transportation of electrons, um, PPAs, uh, corporate PPAs, et cetera. Uh, all the way through to M and A, so there, there's a real sort of life cycle, uh, supply demand, and and the full life cycle of of the project. But but I think ultimately, you know, as with other places in in the globe, um, the approach, the regulatory approach to energy transition, the sort of different taxonomies that are being implemented, mean that there isn't actually a very clear path forward. But but there's obviously a lot of ambition and a lot of uh, capital and, and and clever solutions trying to trying to find ways of actually uh, making improvements in the area. Well, you know, very much understand the broader point that different markets are doing different ways and and some markets in APAC are certainly still doing, you know, almost everything via long-term contracts and and maintaining vertical integration, but at least some are deregulating and, you know, experiencing some pretty volatile prices at the moment as gas prices have spiked. So again, thinking particularly of Japan, Rowan, I might ask you this one. You know, what are the questions your team is getting asked in our long-term forecast, say in Japan, around merchant prices? Like what are the downsides and upsides that people are asking you to run as they think through their economics of their asset over the, you know, over the 10, 20 year time horizon? Yeah. So probably the two the two most common ones in the Japanese context are uh, as you touched on commodity prices, right? It, it, it's got it, it's got the possibility to swing swing market prices the, to the largest extent in the very immediate term. Over the longer term, it's increasingly that that policy kind of uncertainty um, that, that 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 Jason touched on. As an example here, I mean, in Japan, you've got a couple of different changes in policy they used to have a feed and tariff system a changing to the feed and premium they've got a carbon price or an, an emissions trading scheme that they're bringing online and there is a long-term low like 20-year contract low carbon support mechanism that's being brought online as well so you've got three separate policy mechanisms to bring on new capacity and they will have very different price outcomes depending on which of those is the predominant driver of, of capacity to hit net zero targets long term if you see government subsidies out of market through a long-term 20-year contract uh, and you bring on a lot of renewable capacity that way, you'll see relatively low merchant prices over the over the long term versus a world where uh, an emissions trading scheme and, and carbon pricing is used as the predominant lever to bring that capacity online. And you'll see higher prices over the long term, which for the context of a market that is used to feed-in tariffs, corporate PPAs, where the 20 year term is actually used to recover the entirety of the project's um, uh, kind of investment. Valuing that merchant risk when there is this huge uh, divergence across different policy solutions is, is kind of the big question we get in that, in that Japan context at the moment. Gene, you know, given this price volatility, at least in markets that do have, you know, liquid wholesale markets, has the volatility that we've seen over the last couple of years change people's attitude to project finance terms and, and what they're willing to sign up to. How are you seeing the, I suppose, the volatility play out in in your world? Yeah, for renewable projects, um, we definitely see that the tariff has been pretty much um, compressed, um, and so is of course the the overall pricing for our, our project finance loans as well. Um, but I, I think there has been still a lot of interest um, in the renewable space, given that energy transition is very important for the country as well as for corporates. Um, And therefore, project finance banks, we are also very keen to support the energy transition and the development of renewable projects. So in the, from the pricing perspective, we also have seen that um, our margin has also been compressed mm. um, because a lot of banks are also pivoting away from financing fossil fuels and they are also looking at financing more green loans, green projects. 
Um, so with, with that, um, on, on both fronts, while the tariff, um, you can say that they are moving, but in many countries, they're moving away from green tariff um, to auction. Um, and the tariff is very competitive, uh, but you are still seeing a lot of interest in that. Um, at the same time, they are also getting very attractive financing from the bank market or from the capital market. Let's maybe pivot then. Um, and I wanted to get your views on the financing of some newer technologies. So, you know, I think in many ways, when we have these types of conversations, we're all, you know, our mental model is is solar and wind and, and how do we finance that and, and deliver it at scale. Certainly in Aurora's modeling of various APAC markets, uh, we are seeing an increasingly important role for storage and potentially hydrogen. And certainly every conversation we have in Japan with domestic players often centers on hydrogen and ammonia. Um, but even in really mature markets like the EU and, and US, debt funding has been challenging in these spaces. Um, Jean, maybe a question for you. How are project finance banks getting comfortable with the more complex investment cases that often come with storage projects, you know, whatever that storage technology is? And then I might follow up with a question about hydrogen, if that's okay. Mm. Like financing of any new technologies, battery storage or even hydrogen or any other new technologies financing will have to go through an extensive and thorough due diligence process as well as structure. Lenders and their credit teams would be heavily reliant on technical consultants' reports and precedents from other markets, if any, which will help them better assess the risk associated with the new technologies and put in place appropriate financing structures and debt enhancement to address such risk. For instance, like higher DCR, more stringent warranties requirement and maintenance and operation requirements as well. Um, strong sponsors and optic arrangement typically will help to give comfort to lenders for more complex project. And then I suppose, what's the house view at SMBC on the evolution of hydrogen in APAC? And there are some pretty divergent views out there in, in the market. Mm. Is, is there one or is it wait and see uh, as some of these mega projects that have been promised get developed? But we believe hydrogen is still nascent in Asia, but will certainly follow an upward path. While many sponsors are keen to look at hydrogen assets, there are still limitations in establishing key investments parameters on the commercial nature of the projects and the project economics, such as the levelized cost of hydrogen and optic structures, including sale price of hydrogen, so bankability is also another main factor since the market is relatively untested in Asia. While well, SMBC Group itself um, is at the forefront of financing hydrogen project globally, we're actively engaging with our clients to develop their hydrogen pipeline. We, we led the first non-recourse financing of a green hydrogen project in French, Guyana, um, in September 2021. And the project uses hydrogen to store power generated by a solar plant to provide uninterrupted renewable power. Um, but that said, in Asia, hydrogen is still at the very early stage of the development. Jason, maybe to go back to batteries there. So are you seeing much activity in the storage space across APAC? And I suppose what's killing battery projects if they're not getting built in some of these markets? Like what are the what are the biggest roadblocks at the moment? So we are we are seeing a number of battery projects. Uh, we've been working on uh them in different markets. I think, I think again, it, it tends to be a little bit market specific on some of these. I mean, obviously how you, how you sort of monetize the, the, the battery, how it fits in with the regulations, how you get paid effectively for providing that battery storage solution. Um, but we are seeing a number of projects um, which have uh, battery components to them uh, in, in different markets. And, you know, there have been sort of standalone uh, reserve batteries ro rolled out, for example, in, in, in Singapore. Um, and, and maybe maybe as well, just, just to briefly touch upon hydrogen, if, if, if that's okay. Mm. Um, so, I mean, again, we're, we're looking quite closely as a, as a firm, a, a number of hydrogen projects in the region. We're doing a number in, uh, in Australia, for example. We've been doing others in, in the Middle East. Um, and I think one of the potential challenges, it's not just a new product or it's also what sort of goes into actually building a hydrogen project in terms of the different 
areas that, that fit yeah. together to make that. So you've got people, you know, uh, oil traditional oil majors who look at this as an oil and gas project. You've got utility providers, you've got sort of off takers, you've got shippers, etc. All of them are going to be looking at this in slightly different ways and saying, is it utility project? Is it a, is it an oil and gas project, etc. So certainly my colleagues who've been working from sort of term sheet into into full form documents, often you'll see heads of terms. And actually, when they come to document that, people all think they know what they mean, but but they've got slightly different views because they they're using slightly different technologies or terms of art from their own individual perspective. So, I, I think that's it, that's an, another sort of area of, of challenge, just getting the the terminology right and making sure you know all people are viewing the the, the projects on similar terms, even amongst the sponsors. And then, Rowan, maybe to finish up with you here, I know you're working on a pile of battery projects in Japan at the moment capacity wholesale balancing ancillary revenue streams so you know my assumption is it looks a little bit like some of those early gb battery investment cases but real uncertainty around long-term capacity and balancing ancillary payments is is that right or is it something quite radically different yeah there's a bit of a split that, that's definitely one of the key growth areas i think there's been a there's been a huge flurry of interest over the last 12 months in batteries in Japan in particular. And a lot of that was actually driven by grid curtailment issues and yeah. how you access onshore renewables into areas like Hokkaido, where um, the kind of firm connections you required essentially a battery to, to be connected on site to actually get a project away uh, from a solar or wind perspective. But you're exactly right. That, that kind of revenue stack is what we're now seeing as one of the key growth areas and it is getting getting your head around the how do these new balancing markets, which three of the five of them don't yet exist and are, and are kind of coming online, how will those work? It will likely look quite similar to the to a kind of uh, a, a GB example, with the caveat that Japan is 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 a huge market, so the size that we're talking about here is just a lot bigger, and some of the um, characteristics of a balancing or ancillary market where. They're relatively smaller than the wholesale market. They can saturate as you get lots of batteries coming in. That will potentially take a little bit longer in the Japan context and some of the other Asian countries where the demand for the service to keep the frequency stable is just a lot bigger. Um, So you potentially see additional value for longer than you might have otherwise seen it in other markets. But it is that revenue stack across capacity balancing wholesale arbitrage, uh, the, the full split. Yeah. I mean, that challenge of turning, of using batteries as transmission assets, I don't think any market's cracked it, although there are projects in California, Germany, and elsewhere, Australia now with the Waratah super battery that that have done it on a kind of ad hoc bilateral basis. But I don't think anyone's quite got the regulatory infrastructure around that investment case to, to really make it work at scale. Um in the interest of time, I might ask a final question, and I always ask this, at least at the uh, pods that I host. Gene, I might start with you. Who do you read or listen to in the energy space that you think is always good, thought-provoking, and relevant to your work in the project finance sector? For us, every publication is very important as they provide good insight to the energy space. And we will need to follow most of the major ones to ensure that we could address off the latest market development which is critical for our project finance business. Terrific. And Jason, is there anyone you particularly like to podcast with or, or read in your line of, uh, of work? I, I, I think there's, I think there's a, a, a few things that I would, I would talk about. One might be a potential competitor, so I'm not going to mention their, their name. Good, good. Um, so we'll keep them off. Um, I, one, one thing I would do is same as, shameless plug for Alan Overy. I mean, we have got a lot of information on our, on our website, mm-hmm. but particularly um, we've got a publication called Financing the Gap, a blueprint for decarbonization, which we published in November. It's on our website. It's actually just, just some ideas around, you know, how we might go globally for, for, for some of these issues we've been, we've been talking about and, and others, supply chain, um, you know, logistics and uh, et cetera. Um, so that that I'd recommend. The other thing, not particularly energy specific, but uh, I get an email called Morning Brew. Uh, it's it comes out of the the US, and it it just pops into your inbox and gives you quite a nice little overview, a uh, little ten minute read in the morning. So that that's another one of my go tos. I love it, and I can hardly recommend the um, the article you talked about that Alan and Overy produced. I, I I thought it was excellent, and and read it cover to cover. So can definitely second that one. 
Uh, team, thanks enormously for your time today. We've covered it a lot in 35 or, or 40 minutes there, and you're collectively some of the busiest people in the APAC energy space. We're incredibly appreciative of your time. All the best, and thank you again. Thanks so much. It's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. That was Hugo Batten, Aurora's Managing Director for APAC in California. Gene So, Head of Renewables and Sustainable Energy across Asia at SMBC. Jason Humphreys, partner at Allen and Overy, and Rowan von Spreckelsen, principal at Aurora, who leads entries into new markets across APAC and whose current focus is on Japan. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.